Hello, everyone. Welcome back, or welcome for the first time. Uh, we have a lot of first time uh, participants signing up today to the uh, 25th edition of the series, What is a Library if the Building is Closed? At least that's the, the, that was the opening question in March when we started these, uh, right after the pandemic was declared and we all went into lockdown. Uh, so we've been exploring <clears throat> different aspects of that question, uh, internet access, digital services, physical materials, uh, social infrastructure. It's not the scope, but it's, uh, I mean, the full scope of, of the issues that are impacted by this, but uh, it was a good way to kind of organize the discussions and they've been rolling forward. We've had uh, over 50 presenters. They're all identified on the, uh, uh, the pandemic response page. Uh, we're still kind of on fire out here in the West and I don't mean just California, I mean the entire West. Colorado is having one of the biggest fires it's ever had right now. Uh, and this slide kind of captures the compound effect of, of uh, this kind of crisis sandwich that we're in. And this is just the West, you know, we've got floods and hurricanes and we've talked through these, through these uh, issues before, slideshow, uh, and that COVID is, of course, immediate, and for most people, I think it's undeniable, uh, but it really is kind of the backdrop for the, for the major crisis, which should be considered, as everyone has now ex been referring to it, as an existential crisis, and you use the word, and yet you're not, like, responding as though it actually were uh, uh, warming. And so hopefully things will start to change on that. We've been through a, a number of phases or rounds, I guess you would say. Uh, the first phase was kind of you know, WTF is going on. Everybody was just kind of trying to cope with the next day. And then we got into libraries in response. We called it a round two. Okay, how are we gonna deal with all this? How are we gonna reorganize and, and you know, while, while things, while we're learning about this. And then, um, I guess a month ago, or a little more than that, <clears throat> we decided to move forward and think about recovery phase and rebuilding and reimagining and rethinking the library. And we began that, uh, if any of you were with us, with Vince Cerf, uh, the co-father of the internet itself, uh, Crosby Kemper, the IMLS director, and David Lankus, the head of the library school at the University of South Carolina. Outstanding panel and kind of got us thinking about this broad range of issues. And so um, since then, we haven't been on, uh, I've been off uh, traveling across the West, uh, camping, kind of getting out of the house as it were, as a lot of people have been dying to do, I've been able to do that. Um, so apologies for not being back and programming, but maybe it gave everybody a break from this. I don't know, but welcome back. So uh, today we are picking up that same theme and we have uh, uh, an outstanding group and I'm having trouble advancing. There we go. Uh, <clears throat> We are the Gigabit Libraries Network, and uh, we're producing these in partnership with IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. Uh, IFLA is based in uh, the Netherlands and represents the mostly the, the national libraries and national library associations around the world, and some 450,000 public libraries, a couple of million libraries in total. Uh, and it's that population that we are uh, most interested in activating in response and in recovery to the current crisis and in the crises uh, still coming. Uh, this is our general statement. We're open collaboration and, and uh, we focus on different kinds of, has been technology oriented and a lot on uh, wireless technology. Uh, today, going forward with libraries inside out. So this is a, 
This is an idea that has kind of emerged as people have been trying to use or the metaphor for what's going on, what's changing, you know, are we pivoting or, you know, what? And what it seems like and what uh, kind of landed on us uh, a month or so ago was the notion of libraries uh, being, the building is closed, so the services are starting to go out from the library, uh, starting with Wi-Fi. This was the first thing that happened was that libraries turned their, their Wi-Fi signal to the window and boosted the power and are, are providing that service outside of the building. <clears throat> How far outside the building is another question. What other services? If you've ever seen Curbside Larry's uh, video, it's hilarious. Uh, it's like a used car salesman only for curbside pickup. Search it on YouTube, it's hilarious. Uh, today though, we're gonna get more specific on this notion about designing and uh, allowing for these functions and spaces with Sarah, Chuck, Barbara, and Jeff, uh, who will take us out. Uh, there's an article that was from last month, uh, Beyond the Pandemic, New Era. All, it starts to list the things that, that people want from their libraries. And what we're seeing is people are wanting more and more from their libraries, that there are more people that are not just a kind of large scale crises, but you know personal level crises. There's nothing new about this, but maybe people are experiencing them in new ways because of the general circumstances of social, environmental, different kinds of uh, upsets and disorders. And Join so, the meeting. So where you know where is that going? And so that already the library you could say is the Swiss Army knife of institutions. They do more things for more people than any other institution by far, by far, for at no fee, at no fee. I mean, who does that? That doesn't want your wallet or you know your soul or something. Well, libraries do. So they are already that, and but now you know there's more demands, for more services is growing. What? How are they going to cope with that? And and where does it end? You know, it's it's really impressive and a little bit frightening, but. We're going to try to deal with some of it. Don, just before you continue, could you reshare your screen as it's frozen? Thank you. Sorry. C could you reshare your screen? Yeah. It's frozen where it is. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sorry to break your flow. No, no, no. Is that sharing? Hello? Stephen? Uh, it, uh, it's not sharing. Don, either if you send me your presentation or just continue as is. There we go. Great, that's better. <laughs> we see okay. his army knife. Thank you. Uh, did you get the army knife, the first army knife? This one? Now we do. Okay. All right. Already this was Army Knife and demands are growing and growing. So this creates enormous challenges for design, for operations, for training, for skills. We focus mostly on the access part of uh, the, these uh, different blades of the knife. Uh, and before the, before COVID here, roughly one in three adults access the internet at a library. I mean, it's just an astounding number that I, it keeps amazing me. Uh, but there were only 17,000 locations to access that service. And when I say that service, I'm really talking about library Wi-Fi or now Wi-Fi almost entirely, uh, as opposed to just kind of open internet because it's you can get to the internet, the library will take you there, but it will also provide you with all these various digital services, which it, it has. And, and those you had to go to the library uh, uh, if you didn't have another source. Most of these people had another source, but the library offered them something special, safe, quiet, faster speed, something. And <clears throat> so our question then was why not go towards, have the library go out? And this is, this is the current strategy. We're gonna take this up next week. 
uh, with a, uh, a call for, for universal public access uh, in the form of these local neighborhood level, every community should have some sort of public access uh, station. And we've been building these with grants from IMLS, funding projects, kind of combining these various kind of uh, uh, local station functions and should be close to everybody. Should be that close. That'd be great to see these signs everywhere. Uh, here's one, it was a project in Kansas. You know, people love it. Uh, and even you could staff these, I think, if you could get a librarian to go out there and, and uh, you know, on, on a schedule, answer people's questions, you know how it goes. So we'll get into that next week. So for today, it's time for the program and to get me off uh, and to get uh, Jeff Hoover on. Uh, Jeff has put this uh, together. Let me stop sharing here. Jeff has put together uh, uh, an extraordinary uh, group of people to speak with us on these issues. You've seen the outline. If you registered and read it, you have. And so Jeff, uh, welcome. Thank you for doing this and uh, take it away. Okay, well, I, I, hope my, I hope I'm not muted and you can hear me. Absolutely. Ex great, excellent. So I have a good team here with me. Um, let me just introduce them in advance. Um, the team I've invited is Sarah Townsend, Chuck Ray, and Barbara Weedman. Um, uh, so Barbara is a director at Henrico County Library System. Um, and I invited her because at her system, they've seen four library buildings evolve in, in just the past 12 years. So they're really on the forefront of what has been going on with library facilities. And uh, uh, Sarah, who's the Assistant Director of Libraries at Suffolk Public Library in Virginia. Um, I invited her because um, at Suffolk, they have this unique commitment to outreach. And, and she, has, she and her organization there has pioneered some you know, unique pop-up library and outreach solutions. So that's why Sarah is uh, part of the team. Chuck, uh, Chuck Ray at Quinn Evans Architects, um, well, because he's been the lead architect giving physical form to library service initiatives for both um, Sarah and Barbara. And we've worked together on another, a number of projects. Uh, me, I'm here, um, library design director at Tap A Architects because I'm kind of the thread that ties us all, uh, ties us all together. So that, that's um, who we have. And this is, the, this is our, our topic, thinking about what comes next you know, after we've been wrestling with, with the pandemic for a little while. So while public libraries have been evolving in response to changing environments ever since there've been public libraries and the, the, the pandemic has delivered sort of a new set of criteria for some real accelerated evolution. Uh, the, you know, the basic, basic change in, in 21st century library design has been a transition from designing around the need, uh, uh, from designing around the needs of collections to really be more about designing around the needs of people. And uh, so, you know, the storing of information, the access to information in the 21st century has expanded from notions of accessible book stacks, of course, into including accessing information through digital technologies, which created a need for a different kind of space shown here in a early manifestation of these ideas at the Seattle Public Library, uh, one of the most prominent libraries in the United States. But the concept of library as a community commons and, and as a place for sharing ideas rather than just storing and accessing ideas is now widespread. Uh, the shift places emphasis on creating spaces supporting conversations as well as quiet and and, and it means that they need to be attractive destination spaces. So in this um, image here, uh, this collaborative but uh, book list section of this library, actually a, a book comes to mind, it's Ray Oldenburg's The, uh, the Great Good Place, not The, uh, the Great Food Place. Uh, I know the writing may be small on your screen, but the, the Great Good Place, which explores the concept of third places as preferred destinations in a community. So it's, it's not home, it's not work, but it's the other place a person might choose to spend time. So the, the 21st century challenge has been to create good people spaces. And, and that's different. Um, 
it's not rocket science, uh, but as I like to say, designing for human behavior is is way harder than that. Um, people are weird animals, you know. Um, they are they're also social animals. Um, so I want to look at the sec second bullet here about social um, infrastructure. And the other book that comes to mind here is the uh, uh, Palaces for the People by Eric Kleinenberg, who participated in one of these Zoom sessions in the spring. Um, he had he identifies uh, social social infrastructure as places for developing social capital, where human connections are and relationships are are fostered, and libraries feature very prominently in his in his narrative. So, so libraries are that kind of social resource as well as an information resource, and this is part of what um, draws people to the library. Of course. Another part that has been technology. Technology is also a factor in what drives people or attracts people to the library. And of course, many of us and probably all of us participating today have uh, technology infused with every aspect of our work and private lives and, and don't think of going someplace to get on a computer. It's a very obsolete sort of idea, but, but that illustrates really where we are, uh, where we fall on the spectrum across the digital divide. Um, Unfortunately, very many people still come to the library for use of tech, uh, technology devices and access to hand, high, ba uh, high bandwidth information streams. So just uh, for a second, we'll look at what are they using technology for? Um, and this is from Pew. Uh, it seems that doing research is as intensive as just checking email. And that has remained constant for the past couple of years. However, what we see here is that using library technology for formal instruction is, um, is increasing significantly. That's the, the biggest increase of, of those bars, biggest shift. And so to take better advantage of the library technology as individuals, learning basic and advanced digital skills is, is gonna be important. And so in this additional study from Pew, we see that instructional programs and uh, well, they, it's, it's instructional programs is really at the top of the list here, ranking just ahead of increasing the amount of comfortable seating. So as well as being a great comfortable place to be, it's a, a, having um, opportunities to really learn and learn about technology is pretty important. Uh, the most recent State of America Library report uh, indicates that the number of public programs offered per capita has jumped uh, in the last year uh, you know, 27 and a half percent of the number of, of programs attended per capita has also increased almost 17%. So people are coming to the library for this kind of content uh, and activity. It's also interesting to see that, that half of the people would like to see digital production tools in libraries, as well as information gathering and communications tools. Um, and these are the tools that, that could be outside the spectrum of devices that even digital sophisticates may need or want to own, but nevertheless would like to use. And then the last thing here is that still, uh, you know, taking the books out to make space for these 21st century services was not universally popular um, as the last line here shows. However, Pew has not redone this study since 2016. Uh, so we may see a different level of enthusiasm as we look at, you know, in 2020, certainly and, and, and beyond. And we've certainly seen that in some of our library programming and design. So looking at um, these other traditional library activities, this study uh, also from Pew shows that they are still prominent. You know, the basic, you know, uh, basic library activities we all know and love, um, but decreasing while library programs and independent group meetings are increasing. So this is an indication of the type of library spaces we should be creating in future libraries. And th that includes more instruction space and, and, and more group space in general. And that's what we've been doing really. So we have seen a transition from the collection centric to the people centric concepts and from information access to information use and sharing. Uh, in this shift, the quality of space for patrons is increasingly important to, uh, to attract them to the physical library and, and be drawn to space that's configured to really meet their needs um, as individuals, as groups, um, and to be comfortable, focused, inspired, and productive and also surrounded by the tools and resources they need to use and share information. And in fact, sometimes that resource is food. It's important to stay hydrated and uh, keep your blood sugar levels up for you know, long-term stays at the library. Unfortunately, 
the great you know collaborative places and furnishings with which we have infused libraries uh, in this first part of the 21st century are not the right configurations right now. Supporting and encouraging these face-to-face -face interactions with people and physically shared resources like they're doing around the table here is not consistent with protecting people against the spread of the virus. So these socially connective and collaborative library environments and experiences have been you know, upended by the pandemic. Um, you know, sometimes change is an evolution like we've seen in the first couple of decades here, or well, actually in the first, you know, in the last eight decades, maybe for libraries. Um, and other times it, 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 it's an avalanche. And for libraries, the pandemic has been an avalanche. You know, closings and then reopening plans being carefully developed and then only to be scrapped 35 minutes after opening and a new plan developed in response to you know, the real world uh, conditions as they present themselves. So it's been you know, a period of, of tumultuous change. Of course, um, library buildings and spaces will outlast the pandemic, um, but in the interim, as libraries have confronted the urgency of the unique circumstance, there have been changes in how patrons and staff are accommodated in the building. Um, we have you know, now needed to explore socially distanced infrastructure instead of socially connective infrastructure. And everyday face-to-face -face interactions have become you know, FaceTime ones and Zoom meetings or community meetings, library programs, ad hoc interfaces between people. And, and also the patron library, patron librarian interface um, faces the new constraints as well. And staff work environments have been um, altered and modified throughout. And also collection access modes are different. Uh, now, you know, traffic volume and traffic flow and book stacks is controlled um, and returned materials need to be quarantined for uh, several days. Join the meeting. Um, library environments are largely defined by furnishings. So I'm just gonna take a minute to, to go over that. Um, this has been sort of the sign of the times at uh, uh, in, in many libraries as um, where we, so, you know, as we sort of pare back the number of seats in the space and the opportunities for people to spend uh, time, places to spend time in libraries. So where we might've seen, you know, continuous rows of computer seats, probably half of them have been removed and blocked off. Uh, and seats at tables have been removed and stored someplace, probably in group meeting rooms uh, since they're closed, uh, as long as the people group meeting rooms aren't being used to quarantine books. Um, you know, and the internet is awash with temporary disposable and permanent barriers to separate people at tables. And um, and like, you know, many communities in Negritown, Massachusetts, the sort of the right seat in the library is the seat in their own containment vessel, their automobile. That was a recommendation um, uh, for a time and maybe still ongoing. And you know, laptops in the library can be delivered to them in their cars, or of course they can use their own their own devices with the library's Wi-Fi direct to the parking lot. Uh, together with different kinds of furniture and, and adding to it uh, barriers, it has been strategic also to add walls, uh, movable ones done with furnishings. These partitions can be both repositionable and uh, and temporary. Um, and here they're shown in a view of a virtual library model uh, that Demco did, uh, featuring several furnishings responses to the pandemic. Uh, you know, and aside from you know virus mitigation, uh, they actually have additional functionality that contributes to the overall library experience. Um, you know, they they they're obviously working as whiteboards and and can also function as acoustic buffers. Um, so partitions like these in a variety of shapes and sizes can be quite future friendly. You know? enabling patrons to redefine the shape and size of their space in the library. So uh, that's sort of a radical level of reconfigurability and flexibility that emerges as a result of these ideas. Of course, uh, libraries are also needing to engage in behavior control beyond you know, enforcing the wearing of masks. Uh, miscellaneous furnishings, accessories and signage are being employed to control where patrons should stand, where they should go and where, where they shouldn't go in the library. Of course, caution tape can be useful, but you know, more, you know, there are other products that are more permanent and also flexible. Um, staff, uh, many staff whose workspace in the library is in open office spaces and workrooms have been returning. And um, many libraries, you know, sort of occupied every other desk 
in an open office landscape and used you know scheduling software to sort of minimize contact while some people continued to work from home or some days working for home and some days working in the library and the AIA has issued some guidance for developing open office environments in response to the pandemic and the area shown here for instance would have fit 12 workstations and now is reduced to nine uh, so it takes more space and some of the suggestions include you know workstation positions be staggered where possible and rotated to face the same direction and an extra monitor is recommended for virtual meetings uh, without you know, de decreasing screen workspace, some, some changes to the office environment. Relative to um, sort of service points and, uh, and that interface, you know, while self-service options are being emphasized right now, um, also patron service points you know, are, are, are set up for, with crowd control barriers and signage and the, the ubiquitous you know, plexiglass shield while you know these measures are um, important, they, they, it is comforting to think that they may not be permanently needed. So, uh, also some of the some of these changes in spaces may stick with us even after this pandemic has passed. Um, some new services come to mind include you know the better Wi-Fi and technology that's beyond the walls of the building. Um, also, ideas like dial a story or storyline, as an example, from Henrico County Public Library, which Barbara may talk about later. Um, or the New York Public Library has, has embraced the BrainFuse um, program, which provides online and also mobile phone based homework help, reaching people who may not have access to uh, more technology than their mobile phone. Um, so uh, in terms of the new modes of delivering services, you know, the curbside pickup, as Don mentioned earlier, um, is kind of the poster child for pandemic library services. Uh, home book delivery, expanding on homebound services is also happening. Um, and also of course, increased um, emphasis on ebook collections um, and Zoom story, story time and other opportunities for doing uh, online interfaces with people. Um, relative to social impacts, you know, the, the more space between patrons that we'd like to provide in libraries, well, you know, that just takes more space. And, and the barriers between patrons and between patrons and library staff are spatial barriers. And there, so there is really a spatial impact to getting people back into the library that needs to be accommodated. And then there are invisible structure impacts, um, such as the really fundamental thing is a greater volume of fresh air. Um, better air infiltration and more strategic airflow. Uh, for HVAC information, uh, if you want to, I recommend a, a webinar and how to use well-designed principles to address COVID-19 and create healthier libraries. And there's the link to the webcast, which I guess we can share in chat or something. Um, the portions of interest of HVAC comes in about 23 minutes and 50 seconds. So you can forward, fast forward to that point and, and get some good information about uh, what can be done with HVAC. Lastly, providing supplemental library service without a library building, of course, is increasingly interesting. All of these building related challenges are mitigated uh, and library service is supplemented by thinking you know, outside the library box. Um, and this is my, my last slide before I segue. Um, but up until the pandemic, we have been mostly concentrating on getting the community into the library for the, all these years. Uh, and now there's sort of a renewed interest in getting the library into the community. The concept you know, is not new, um, but the pandemic has extended the idea to new horizons. Some 20th century precedents include something like you know, the familiar bookmobile, um, but in the early digital age, um, additional ideas emerged like the computer lab bookmobile uh, from Houston and, and other places. Um, also, there was this IGS, Information Gas Station experience, experiment funded by the Gates Foundation, which was designed to be a movable, um, uh, information station in, in two parts. There was a self-service uh, gas station pumps um, and also a double-sided service unit uh, intended for uh, remote side-by-side -side service and conversation with a librarian. So they would take this thing and put it in different places throughout the community. Oh, in Paris, there was also a project to put a um, sort of a complete walk-in but demountable library staffed by a librarian in, uh, in metro stations. But in general, the notion is to get a piece of the library into locations where, where people already congregate. Um, development of this notion has been continued, certainly, and with outreach efforts in Suffolk, Virginia, which uh, you know, Sarah will talk about 
later. But uh, before we get to that, I'll turn it over to Barbara and Chuck. Thank you, Jeff. There you are. Hi, um, Barbara. Hi. As Jeff but mentioned, you, I uh, can you hear me? me? Yes, we can, Barbara. I just wanted to interrupt a moment. Uh, we had a question sure. about slides. <clears throat> are you guys ready to share slides? We have it as a video, but if you are, maybe you can post your email in the chat and then people can send you a request. Absolutely. Okay? All right, thanks. Sorry for interruption. No problem. Uh, well, I just wanted to say, as Jeff mentioned, I feel very fortunate that our library system has been able to open several libraries um, with the brain work that you are hearing. Uh, Jeff is really a remarkable visionary. And if I could, in the 10 years I've worked with him, I'd grant him an honorary uh, MLS. Mm -hmm. He really does understand public libraries, um, what we are doing and what we would like to do. And so um, just wanna say that, um, getting started here. And also that we really were pondering in the pre-COVID world where, um, like he mentioned, we were able to open these new libraries, three large libraries in the past five years. These are the principles that sort of arose when we were thinking about these new buildings and kind of this shift we have experienced. And so um, what we thought we could do is Chuck and I will kind of talk through these essential principles, looking at some of the images from our new libraries. And of course, some of this will be applicable and some of this will be a little bit heartbreaking because of COVID, um, but that's kind of what we're wanting to do here. And the five principles are flexibility, collaboration, creative or creation, community building and civic e-government. We've talked about some of this already and you'll see some of the overlap as we move through the images, kind of based on these five principles. So Jeff, if you go ahead and get started, um, Chuck and I will go. And, and Chuck will talk from the architectural design aspect and I hope to speak um, some to the librarian and library work aspect. So Chuck, um, do you wanna tell us what these are? These are some images of children's program spaces and some of them like their libraries. And I think when we yes. talk about flexibility from a design perspective, we also think about adaptability um, and the notion that these spaces can be enclosed with uh, a movable glass partitions gives us somewhat of a, a permeable barrier, uh, allowing those spaces to be expanded when the program overflows, but also allow them to be opened up for just general activity when uh, a program isn't scheduled. That was right, and I think, goal. yeah, that whole concept of less rigid um, is really important, more visible. The story time room in the upper right, we often get more than 100 kids and we open the glass doors and the kids can spill into the area. No one's turned away, which has been really wonderful. Um, and again, you see it in the other library, the folding doors, it just gives you a lot of options where you can expand, you can adapt, like you said, Chuck. So these have been wonderful spaces, the story time rooms versus what used to be kind of in a traditional library, a closed off room. You oftentimes could not see in at all, except maybe through the door. This invites that sort of look at what's going on, come on in activity. And I think the, the finishes that we selected for these rooms are also uh, allow a certain level of flexibility hard, cleanable surfaces that can allow for messy activities uh, to occur. Um, you know, good, good lighting control and audiovisual control is also, you know, really critical to giving these rooms a multi, multiple of, of function, multiple functionability. Is that, a, is that the right phrase? Yeah, multi-purpose. Yeah. And I, I yeah. agree that the team was very intentional about thinking what would happen in these spaces or what could happen in these spaces. And so we talked about the crafts that you do as part of story time. And like Chuck said, very durable finishes. I mean, I think a lot of the principle of flexibility is we have to be able to pivot and adapt to change and quickly. And COVID is really an unprecedented example of where we've had to do that. So any built-in flexibility you have helps you adapt as you move along in library service. I think the, the next image is uh, an interesting, um, image of the digital media lab at the, the first library we did with uh, with Barbara and Enrico and Jeff uh, over 
almost um, almost eight years ago now, the the digital media lab had been really a computer lab, but we envisioned this as a space to teach robust uh, computer skills with robust technology. Um, and the thinking here was to have the 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 activities on display, but that glass wall again, like with the children's area, is operable. And the, the thinking is that it can open up to this these spaces to the exterior. So if it is a larger event, um, you have the ability for their activities to bleed out into the adjoining seating areas. Right. And I think just again that visibility, open, welcoming, you can move stuff around. Um, again, all all comes to flexibility. And then we mentioned one of the principles is creation. That's exactly what happens here. People are creating content with the tools that we give them that they might not otherwise have at home. Um, and so it's really a wonderful space. We have digital media labs, we call them DMLs in all of our larger libraries. You wanna start with this one, Barbara? Sure, yeah. So this is our one of our teen spaces in the Libby Mill Library. And again, with flexibility, one of the things I think about this space is you have spaces within a space. <laughs> you can move stuff on the right. You can see that there's a gaming area. We also have uh, study rooms right off of this space. The furniture is adaptable. You see the kids on the left, you can pull it out or you can just sit in it um, like a regular chair. The idea again is always offering options to customers and allowing them to move the furniture if they want to in a way that makes sense versus everything being fixed like it used to be sort of in the traditional library setting. Um, the stacks were there, the furniture couldn't be moved, the doors were closed to the story time room. Again, just this idea of flexibility and um, letting people kind of choose the activity that they would like within the space. Yeah, and I think just to add on, I think that the notion of having gaming front and center uh, with rules that the teens have to agree to is a is a good way to incorporate gaming and the social social aspects of that into library service. Yeah, this is a uh, the the notion everything can be mobile in a library potentially, and the idea of having flexible furniture, rolling whiteboards, um, seating that can be moved around and create uh, auditorium style events. Uh, this is a, a a really simple way of populating a. a very open space with the furnishing solutions. This was a renovation that we did, um, not with Barbara, but in an academic setting where the budget was really all, always focused, only focused about furnishings. And like Je Jeff said, the added benefit now with those types of items is that they can serve as temporary barriers for COVID. Right, and I, I put this image here from a library we just opened nearby to me in the Boston area. So it opened during you know the, the pandemic restrictions. But but I, what I want to illustrate here is um, not just that the book stacks could be rolled around to be a new configuration if that's desired to showcase the books in a different way in the new book area, um, but also that it could be completely rolled out of the space, and this space can then be used for. Um, gigantic events um, uh, that take over the entire lobby of the space. Um, so that's a, sort of just another way of accommodating flexibility. And, and as we've seen in some of these, the other images is, oh, wouldn't it be great if just the rooms could be, you know, could change size sometimes. And, and you know, these kinds of things really allow that to be accommodated. I agree. I think everything on wheels is very helpful. Lots of things on wheels. Good thing. So collaboration, yeah, is the no, another principle here. And what we tried to show is, again, these options that we offer to our library customers with, within our new buildings. Um, and we have extremely high demand for the meeting space, as we were talking about. And so you see some of the, the settings that we have, again, more visible, more open, more transparent. Um, in the newer buildings. And I'll let Chuck talk about some of these spectacular rooms that he helped design. Yeah, these, these group study or collaboration spaces, um, we, are, we are populating all areas of the library with these at this point, from adults to teens and children. And our thinking has been that the spaces need to be uh, outfitted with a variety of different furnishings because we don't want to necessarily mandate a certain type of engagement based on the furniture solution. So in some cases you see in the upper right corner, 
uh, there, those are two rooms that are adjacent to one another. One is outfitted with a table and chairs facing a monitor, and the other is with more casual seating that's more conversational. Um, that's those are both in the teen area, and you see you see folks using them intensely all day long. Um, we think it's also important that these kind of collaborative spaces be on display, but but not be behind hard barriers because we want to make sure that there's a safe environment with strong visual sight lines uh, into these spaces. Um, and it's just a, it, there are little moments, we think there are little design moments in the library to create little pockets of enclosure. Right, and these are some of the, some of the heartbreak images, I guess, that, mm -hmm. that, that Barbara mentioned earlier. Yeah. And, so, and here's kind of another one. Yeah, but, this one is, yeah, go ahead, Barbara. I was gonna say, you know, we are open. These, these libraries are now open. Um, and while we might not have the same numbers of people, we still do have people in these spaces. And, you know, the, the other wonderful part is when it's a time when everyone is longing for humans, the visibility and the people watching, again, that idea of drawing people in when they see others and they see activity still remains. So there's, there's my hopeful note. Right, and uh, this illustration, uh, this image illustrates also the notion of collaboration isn't just, you know, in a box with a group. Uh, sometimes there's a useful kind of uh, um, uh, um, critical mass of buzz in an environment that in activates it. And this is that kind of space so that the conversations aren't necessarily all boxed up, but there's a place for conversations to happen, like kind of like hotel lobby type space in terms of those casual meetings. Yeah, we spent a lot of time researching uh, other environments to get clues, design clues. And uh, when we when we were traveling, that's a little bit of the, hope we get back to that. Uh, the, the travel was always about finding those other public spaces that could help inform the design and character of our library environments. Uh, we spent a great deal of time uh, in airports and hotels. And um, it's interesting to see some of the clues uh, that we get from the hospitality industry to help us create spaces that are inviting and welcoming. You know, the, the we got to recognize that collaboration occurs across all age bands, age widths, maybe. Um, and the image on the bottom is one of my favorites. Um, these, these little boxes, these childlike boxes were designed at the Living Mill Library. And uh, I think these are three images that Jeff shot on the, on the night of the dedication of the ribbon cutting. Um, and we've seen adults say they want to get in those boxes. They're not discouraged necessarily, but uh, we do see these as um, little moments for the kids to find a place of their own that's scaled appropriately, appropriately to them. Yeah, and kids are kids are great. You know, these kids don't know each other, but they're sharing a space and making a connection. The yeah. other neat thing is that very simple, um, where you see the kids collaborating in their way at the computers, we put benches there. Um, and so that's a very simple way of allowing multiple kids to be there together or for a small child to sit right next to their mom on their computers versus having the traditional more like task chairs at the computer. So we tend to put the benches in the children's sections. When we look at, yeah. Go Barbara, you go. I just, you know, this is fun. This is creation for kids. And um, what I love about this, when you think of flexibility is on the right, we kind of call that our deconstructed playhouse. So it is not rigid in the sense that it's a traditional four walls and it looks just like a little house. It is playful, it's imaginative, um, and it, but it still achieves the same end. And you can see the kids using the puppets that we provide on, in these playhouses. It, it just, it's not fixed in the way that some of the more traditional libraries would have a children's section, even down to the play stuff. It's more freewheeling and imaginative. Yeah, our, our design inspiration for that space, if you go back to check this and Jeff, was the, the idea of a deconstructed cardboard box. I mean, what a great thing that we all played with when we were kids. How many, how many ways did we reimagine a cardboard box? And so it's, they it's love our, it. we don't want to be thematic necessarily. We want to inspire creativity and let the children you know, drive it in any direction they want to go. Right. Jeff, sort you sort of you moved away. Excuse me, Don? Is that when you knew you wanted to be an architect when you were redesigning your cardboard box? <laughs> I don't, uh, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know when that started, but my parents say it's been a, for a long, long time. So uh, yeah, I'll take that as inspiration. So we had we, a really special moment in Fairfield with Barbara. We did. 
We did. And, and I think this one really ties to collaboration too, Chuck. Um, where this was, this is in our newest library, which opened five months before COVID, um, the Fairfield Library. This was on opening night during our grand opening. People sat right down and started using stuff and we were so pleased, it happened so naturally. This piece of furniture was a collaboration um, between librarians and Chuck's team and a furniture design team that, that Chuck reached out to where we tried to enhance the experience for adults needing to use a computer with little kids. And so in essence, it's kind of like a playpen um, with imaginative toys and manipulables that you can swap out and you see the mirror for the baby. And there've been some changes to this since then, and it's actually being marketed now. This photo went viral, tens and tens of thousands of images in libraries um, around the world looked at this. And it also has been looked at to be used for parents who are working in unusual um, situations at work. So we have a pod of these and they've been very popular. They're what we call a parent-child PlayStation. And that was, again, this team synergy, librarians and architects thinking toward what we could achieve and us describing a challenge and the architects helping us solve it with a, a furniture solution. So to me, collaboration and creation on this one. I think it was also nice we were given some latitude, you know, that Barbara and her team, there was a challenge laid out there, it was a pretty high bar, um, and it became a very, uh, it just, it's one of those moments in, in your design career that you go, okay, we got something really, really right. Yeah, That's and it, it will help what, the customer. Can I ask a question, what, what is that just, if you go back one slide, what is that just beyond on the other side? Uh, the purple the thing, Don? Yeah, well, that's the, what's over the next the wall? Oh. That's the end wall of the children's uh, room, children's space. Um, it's an, um, kind of an or, organic amorphous uh, series of openings. That's the door to the exit stair, but that, that wall continues and there's a series of punched openings that, that have seating within them that um, children sit in, like, like the boxes at the Libby Mill Library. Exactly, those, right. Those are those Same theme, different shape. Yep. Very and there cool. are four of those pods, so yeah. We like to think about, you know, not just digital creation, but analog creation. And this library had a, the challenge of helping us, or of asking us to help the community learn how to teach themselves life skills. And um, so a creation classroom, which is really intended to be more like a STEM lab for everything from um, learning how to, uh, craft Book. or yeah. sew or cook or repair your lawnmower. Uh, this space is paired with an outdoor activity space through the door you see in the right-hand side of the left image. So you can um, have the classroom extend to the exterior, which in this world day and age, it's very important to have outdoor space for, for classes of this nature. Yeah, so durable um, surfaces again and hands-on creation. And then we have the digital media labs for digital creation. So one of the other principles we thought about was really community building. And this is a wonderful photograph. I'll let Chuck um, talk about this where you can see one of our new libraries as part at, of a development. And it was pretty much the first thing there like an anchor in a mall so I'll let Chuck talk about it. It's a unique. Yeah, it's a really wonderful story. The county approached a local developer who had a, a, a plan approved for the redevelopment of a 80 acre parcel, a mixed use redevelopment, kind of a new urbanistic uh, place within Henrico County. And initially the developer was, uh, we don't think a library is a really good idea. We don't see the value in libraries. And the county said, not so fast, maybe you should do some research. And they did, they were very smart about it. And they came back and said, oh, we have to have the library in the development and then there was right. like a thousand visitors a day was kind of yeah. a compelling it, it was. argument. A, a little bit yeah <laughs> and um and what happened was it was a phenomenal partnership between the county and the library system uh, the developer and our design team uh, some tough negotiations because they weren't willing to necessarily give the library the premier parcel of land and 
And um, uh, at some point, the comment was made to me, why are we letting the library, you know, di dictate you know, how, the, how the space around the central you know, lake is determined? And I said, because we can, and because you should. And so it's, uh, it's phenomenal. I think, I think it is the centerpiece of the development. It, the development has taken off. Um, housing, retail, um, uh, office space is just popping up all around it. I don't know when the deadline will be for them to complete it. They're very careful, very thoughtful. Uh, developer, but it's a phenomenal story. The library was packed from day one. It's in the Barbara can describe the usage figures. It's it's incredible. Just, yeah. It, very, very high use, high use visits. Um, people now that the townhomes that you see exist are coming in all the time and it drew people from um, surrounding areas as well as the city that our county is just north of. Um, and I do want to point out this is a fairly recent photo. And we have since added solar panels and you can see them on the roof, which is another yeah. exciting thing um, with our new library. So yeah, one it's, thing, it's yeah. powerful. The one last thing about that is that the developer got very smart and they hired a very, uh, very, very well-known firm to uh, the Project for Public Spaces to help design all the open space between all the buildings. They went back and really redesigned all that connective tissue between the buildings that they planned in the library to really create kind of meaningful outdoor spaces that were seamlessly woven into the, the, the library par parcel. And that image on the left here, upper left is an aerial view of, of a, a terrace, a deck that overlooks the lake, of walking trails around the lake, of the way the hardscaping and landscaping was shaped. Um, just a really nice, um, nice moment of collaboration. The in that upper, floor, yeah, just um, in light of COVID too, if you see in the upper left, you can see some of the furniture <laughs> that's outside the popped out box window. Um, and we're finding that whole area to be popular when the weather permitting because of COVID. It's a beautiful space. There's swings and paths and people are out there with their dogs. It's, it's, here's an example of during COVID, we have this wonderful outdoor space that can be used by library customers. We designed the library on the left at the same time we designed the library on the right. Uh, so Libby Mill is left, Verona is on the right hand side. And this was a completely different part of the county, very rural, very agrarian, um, very much a needed destination place because it replaced about a 5,000 square foot small branch library that had been there for many, many years. The site is just wonderful. It's heavily wooded, backs up to a wetlands area, um, a former former private you know, farm and, and, and home. Um, and we took inspiration from the fact that we did some archaeological research on site and found the remains of a, um, of, a, of a tavern, of an inn along the road. And we used that to inspire this notion that there would be a, a public green or a tavern green out front. Um, and so the library really bleeds, the interior spaces bleed and are easily seamlessly connected to this exterior space, which can be used for uh, book swaps and farmers markets and all sorts of activities that benefit the community broadly and that support library programs you know, that, that Barbara and her team are organizing. Yes, very different style, but they still have that outdoor plaza aspect that can be used for all sorts of stuff programming wise. We think so, you know, community build, go, yeah. you go Barbara. Your turn. I was just gonna, yeah, community building. Um, one thing to notice here is just these spaces that are kind of bonus spaces, these are lobby-ish, entry-ish areas, but they can be used for um, multiple purposes. Again, that concept of flexibility. You see the staircase and on the right, um, can't totally tell in this photo, but that is sort of like a grand, very large staircase that goes up and people can sit in it kind of like stadium seating. And so if you have a speaker set up, which we do, um, where the kids are sitting at those tables with the red chairs, you change the aspect of that space and can use it for something completely different. So again, just being open, airy, um, well lit, all of these spaces can be used for multiple purposes. The, the image on the right has, you can see that black Ooh, bar. Jack, sorry, sorry. Sorry, it's okay. By the way, you, did, you might know, we didn't rehearse this. This is just kind of a- <laughs> <laughs> We're winging it. <laughs> we're, we're winging it, but it, we know what we're talking about, hopefully. That image on the right, Jeff, can you highlight that, uh, that black bar up at the ceiling there? That is um, a monstrous uh, projection screen yes, that can is. drop down from the 
from the ceiling. Um, it, the, the box comes down about 12 feet and stops. And then the screen rolls down from that. Um, and the library can use this kind of stadium seating to be able to uh, show movies. I think the first movie was, uh, was it Wizard of Oz? Is that right? Yeah, I think so. That was close to opening. Can, you, of our still, can you still take advantage of this space now that the library is reopened uh, for that kind of programming? We can, and the, and the reason is it's open and airy. I mean, what that kind of design lends itself to more options. So you could have people sitting if they're wearing their masks and they're properly socially distanced across those wooden benches. Um, and then if you look at Fairfield on the left, I just wanted to point out again too, what's wonderful with that type of design is the customer has immediate orientation upon entry. And so if you walk in the front door of Fairfield, you can look up to your left and see the children's section, very visible and clear up to the right. You can see the teen section. Um, you can see the conference room, which is clearly labeled. We, we, we did this, you know, thinking what all can you see and how does that instantly help a customer? Um, and then we're going to talk about the space at the top of the stairs and to the right is all the children's, uh, the adults collection. So you have, to me, that library design has the best orientation, natural orientation from one point I've ever seen. And I think it's very helpful to customers. Um, this, this image shows something that is really important. We have the word community here. We had a lot of community engagement. Jeff and Chuck did incredible presentations um, with the community as we got input about what was desired. And that space, which we call family gathering, came out of that community engagement. And it was that people wanted to be able to see, and this library, again, is the best people watching and views but they wanted to be able to kind of gather their family. If they had a kid in teens or they had a kid in um, children's or another kid was coming in the front door, they wanted to be able to see that. So it's kind of like a, a mid space mezzanine and it's, it's, there's people of all ages all the time using that space. It was really a nice, um, a nice point of conversation with the community. The community gave us this clue. We didn't necessarily hear it from the library staff, but there were, we found that through the conversations with the community there were multi generational families coming to the library all the, all the time. So something we hadn't done in the other libraries with Barbara, and I don't think we've done it much before, but we've done it a lot since, is taking a portion of the program area and break it out for this family gathering space. So it's appointed with a variety of different seating options and alternatives. There's, there's some small two-person pods for tutoring, which occurs, or for small group study, some casual seating. Uh, it's got a lot, and our theme throughout all of our projects is to make sure that we don't have just one singular design solution for furniture. That we need a variety of seating and, and, and table options for a variety of activities. Humans like choices, definitely great to provide options. So the, it's all about having community. And I think these are two great images of the children's areas. Uh, for Fairfield is on the left and Verona is on the right. Um, and we want to build community within that age group as well. So having a variety of places for the children to be together and with families and caregivers is important. Also this celebrating is, the history of community, right, Barbara? Uh, mm -hmm. This this has um, been wonderful. What you see on the right is one of two examples of um, us having digital content that's dynamic and flexible, again, that we can change at any time in two of our libraries that honors um, the community, members of the community, um, things that have happened in that community, and it's interactive with customers. So we call it the Trailblazers Wall in our new library in Fairfield. And then on the left, when you talk again about building community and creation, we added a two-person recording studio that's optimized to be very simple, where people can record a story, um, they can interview one another, and so you're seeing that, that's in our newest library. And, and the idea there is for people to be able to create content and for us, hopefully to preserve and share it at some point too. So again, that all helps build community. Upstairs and, at Libby Hill Library is yeah. a, a leased space. They partnered with Junior Achievement to create a finance park, which is an interactive um, uh, learning on, on display kind of place for one of their programs that they teach in 10th grade and in high school classes within Virginia. Um, 
and it's all about helping people learn how to be active members of the community and be responsible responsibly you know, from a fiscal perspective. It's a great partnership. It's a great partnership. And again, the spaces, we have an eye toward collaboration. And if the building is naturally um, reflecting collaboration, I think we see it grow exponentially just in the services that we provide. Right. Not so much in this space, particularly. As, as no, this <laughs> a little bit different, though this was a renovation. Um, and you should have seen it before. <laughs> so, you know, now we're kind of shifting from that community building naturally over to civic and e-government. And this is um, a beautiful meeting room that was renovated by the same team. And it serves as a polling place. And right. it we're serves as a place. Up for, setting up for the election, right? That we are. We've been very, very busy this week. We have three libraries that are polling places. Um, it is also used for meetings um, of local government officials and town halls. So again, you know, community building and e-government. Um, we do tax assistance. In two of our libraries, it's free for the public um, through partnerships. And so again, these meeting spaces and thinking of the library as really enhancing in a positive way um, people's experience with their local government. And a really good example of that recently and COVID specific is this new library that I mentioned um, we opened this time last year, just about, and, you know, five and a half months later, it was closed in the beginning of the pandemic. It was one of the first that reopened, um, first in early May with curbside service, and then toward the end of June with limited uh, service to the public. It's open. In the meantime, however, our local government was approached by the state. Um, they were seeking a place for a call center, again, the state, but not local government because their space was not adequate to have phones and computers in the city building that they occupied. And so our local county government asked me as the library director and I conferred with our um, IT head, who's amazing, amazing, Jennifer Wood, and asked, is there any library space that could be adapted while you're closed for a COVID call center that would serve the region under the auspices of the state. And our newest library, because of this type of thinking, flexible ports everywhere, options, um, thinking through contingencies was ideal. And so I believe it was March 30th and um, our region sort of closed on March 16th. This space that you were seeing was shifted. Um, some of the computers were separated county IT and library IT retrofitted it with the state and it served as a communication hub for COVID for as long uh, until we opened. Um, we needed to open back up to the public at which point it moved. But that really to me was a, a wonderful testament to Jeff and Chuck and everyone that worked on these projects that that inbuilt flexibility really um, provided another library service. It was information sharing. People needed answers at a time of crisis and library staff assisted medical personnel in answering some of those calls. It was triaged, but it was very helpful. And um, we were just really pleased that like Don said in the beginning, the Swiss army knife, right? We, we were able to help from this new library building in a way that no one ever expected. And I think that is how as librarians and in our profession, we, we gain credibility, we, grant, we gain visibility. And I think there are opportunities um, that we have seen within COVID. And here you see at a delicate time, we made it to the front page of the local newspaper here talking about all of the preparations that we did in order to gradually in a phased approach, welcome people back into the library buildings. That's so, fun. yeah. That's a great sort of summary before we segue into like from being within the library building to sort of thinking outside the boundaries um, with, uh, with a conversation with Sarah here. So, uh, hi, Sarah. So, um, so Sarah, what, is, what are some of the uh, recent developments in your initiatives for community outreach? Um, have they changed and evolved with the pandemic? And um, are there things you've learned through the pandemic process that um, you think you'll be carrying 
forward? Absolutely. I think I um, wanted to walk you all a little bit through our history, but the common thread that I'm seeing is that the preparation that we did, Barbara was lucky and had these wonderful buildings that were sort of ready made to be flexible. Um, I think our strength is we had a work culture and an outreach approach that has allowed us to be flexible and think on the fly and not be so tied to our buildings when we couldn't be. Um, so I wanted to share a little bit with you all about the things we did pre-pandemic and then hopefully uh, and if we have time share some of the things we've done during the pandemic but mostly the lessons we've learned. Um, so I want to start with some quick history. I joined SPL about seven years ago to build an outreach department and I won't bore you with all the details, but the gist of it is, is I'm a very impatient person and I wasn't willing to wait until we could get a fleet of vehicles and new staff to get out of our buildings. So I launched pop-up libraries, which Jeff referenced earlier. Um, it was just a quick and dirty way to get us out of our buildings and providing services in the community. And it's essentially a library in a 10 by 10 tent or at the six foot table. You can really do it in different sort of models. Uh, we figured everything we could do, our core services in the building could be shrunk and made mobile and done outside in the community. So we signed people up for library cards, offered internet access. Um, programming is a really key component to our pop-ups, reference, checked out books. And the big thing is, was we went wherever people were gathered. Um, so next slide, please, Jeff. So school cafeterias during lunch, in front of grocery stores, inside of restaurants, breweries, um, of course, in neighborhoods and community centers and rec centers, uh, we're a regular staple at the farmer's market, the YMCA, public housing communities, apartment complexes. Uh, one of those pictures is in the hallway of Workforce Development Center, which side note, if a great way to get a lot of people to sign up for library cards is to bottleneck a, a hallway. <laughs> they have to stop and talk to you. So those first few years, we said yes to everything while we sort of honed in on where the need really was in our community. But in addition to sort of figuring out where we needed to be and what we needed to be doing, it also helped us shape an approach to outreach that has in turn shaped our approach to library work in general. Next slide, if you don't mind. So some things that we learned in those early years are what have shaped what our staff call our outreach mentality. Um, and the first one is that it's about engagement, not just information. So outreach in libraries often looks like an information table. That was my experience prior to um, Suffolk. It's a program flyers, maybe a library card sign up. But what we learned is in order to truly have a meaningful connection with people, but also in order to see them again, you need to address a need right then and there. So if someone, you meet someone that is interested in an, your ebook collection, for example, um, you don't just hand them a flyer and say, go to our website or come into the library and we'll help you. You likely will never see them again. Um, you need to help them connect to your Wi-Fi right there, have them get out their phone, download the app and help them check out their first book. They need that tangible experience to really understand how the library can impact their lives. So it's a part, it was a shift in thinking for us to really thinking of outreach as a true service point, which is also why a lot of our outreach has a programming component. Mm -hmm. um, and this is important also because outreach is often the first moment and your first opportunity to build a relationship with people. So we want our staff to approach outreach like they're building relationships. So put the same effort into connecting and getting to know people in the community that they do to those regular patrons that come in every day to the buildings. And I actually think this is a lot easier in an outreach environment because we are on other people's turf. Uh, we go where people are no matter where that is. In the early days of pop-up libraries, I went to some probably ill-advised places, uh, a payday loan place. I will not be repeating that pop-up <laughs> library. But the idea was just where are people, where are they living their lives, what are they doing? Fine, let's go there. Um, we don't expect them to come to us. And through all of that, we really learned to change quickly. So in outreach, as needs change, as priorities change, you have to pivot and change. I know we're all sort of sick of that word pivot, but um, 
So an outreach spot may be super busy one week and then the following weeks, your audience has disappeared for whatever reason. It's not a big deal. Move your services where the people are. And ultimately that has helped us shape our idea in Suffolk that we aren't defined by our buildings. And that might seem like a strange thing to say in a presentation that is partially about building design. But the fact is if we define ourselves by our buildings when our buildings are shut for six months or longer, then what are we? So we see our buildings as a tool and a very important tool. And we're in the process of building a new library that we're so excited about. Um, and it's a tool at our disposal, but it's not the core of what we do and why we exist. Next slide, please. So pop-ups launched outreach for us and um, we have a robust community engagement department now. We were able to get rid of a 30 year old um, bookmobile and get a smaller, leaner, meaner tech, chock full of tech uh, vehicle that really acts as an anchor for offsite and outdoor programming. And unfortunately during COVID, it has just decided that it also wants a six month break and has yeah. under normal circumstances, it would have been a great uh, tool for us to take our services into the community, but it's been full of mechanical problems. Uh, next slide, please. But pre-COVID, our community engagement department took that pop-up library idea and have really embraced the idea of going where people are. So they did traditional bookmobile neighborhood services, but also did things like library card signups in prisons and jails on a regular basis for individuals who are preparing to return to our community. Um, programming and day facilities for adults with disabilities, that's become a huge core part of what this department does. Deposit collections in senior communities. Um, they even taught coding and some after school programs for a while because that was a gap in the tech education happening in our community. Um, they go every, or they went every month to one of the major food pantries in our area that people would line up for hours before it opened. And so they would go and talk to people and see what they needed and give them free books and get them signed up with library cards. Um, they also just really, this team really had the mentality of going where people are. So they would walk the neighborhoods, meet people, um, let them know verbally about a new service or event coming to the library. So their work was varied and wild. Early in my career, someone told me outreach librarians are guerrilla librarians because they uh, don't follow the rules. They <laughs> do things on the fly. And I think that really sort of summed it up. But while they're not doing that in-person outreach anymore, the principles of that sort of outreach have guided all of our work, especially during COVID. So next slide, please. So the pandemic has obviously changed what we currently do, but there are a few things that we're predicting will stick around and shape our work and probably shape this uh, new building that we're designing and building right now. So the first thing is the need for semi-permanent services out in the community. And um, I'm excited about some of the things that Don mentioned earlier, because I think there's some exciting solutions coming for this um, out in the field, but virtual school has thrown everyone. And maybe you are one of the lucky ones with a community that's just gotten it right. But the digital divide was already huge in Suffolk. And with everyone home trying to do school and work right now, it's gotten even worse. Um, there's a lack of connectivity either for socioeconomic reasons or but also Suffolk is huge 430 square miles so there's a lot of um, rural areas and people just don't have cell service and or cable running to their homes so we've sort of bumbled our way through this I don't know that we hit on a solution that has made a huge dent but what it's done is uh, made it very clear to us that our outreach has to be more regular and for longer periods of time. Um, you know, popping up in someone's neighborhood one hour a month is not going to cut it when you need your kids connected for school, you need to print materials, you need to check out materials for your whole family that's home. So it's escalated our conversation about the need for more semi permanent satellite library spots in the community. Um, the second point will not be a surprise to anyone. The need for human connection is huge. People are starved for that connection right now. Um, so we started doing virtual programming the day we closed in March and have continued to do so, but we've started to move away from, you know, the librarian in front of a camera doing story time. We do still do that, but have put more of our energy into 
programming that builds community online in particular right now. And we see that being a theme going forward online and in person. People are not just looking to be entertained anymore. I think we saw that early in the pandemic. They're not just even looking to learn something new from the library. Um, people are starved for a real conversation to make a real friend uh, to build an ongoing relationship. So we're seeing a real uptick in, um, we started a Discord community for teens around gaming and are having just hangout times over Discord. And so this sort of programming where people can connect with each other in a more meaningful way has flourished. And so I think that will guide how we think about programming going forward. Um, also on demand is in demand. Uh, we were talking about curbside before the pandemic. Now, of course, all of us have had to figure it out on the fly, but we think it's here to stay, whether it's actual curbside or other services like that. Um, I've enjoyed the convenience of getting more things delivered or being able to pull up my car to a place and have things brought to me. And I think some of those aspects are gonna stay. And so that will inform how we design our building, but also how we develop, make service decisions going forward. Um, exploring home delivery more intensely, drop sites for hold pickups and other ways just to get materials to people in a way that fits their schedules and their lives and their expectations. And I'll end my little spiel part with sort of what the big question is for us. And I don't have answers for this, but I said in the beginning that we, our work is really guided by going where people are. And the struggle for us right now is people are home. And so physically, they're not gathering, there are not events happening. Um, people are even, you know, just going to the grocery store maybe once a week or once a month. So our ability to actually meet people where they are has been limited to the virtual environment, which is also very limiting because of the digital divide. So there are no crowds to follow for us. So it's sort of this big question mark for us about how do we take ourselves into people's homes, not necessarily literally, but maybe in the future. Um, and their lives without physically being near them. And then also just pondering, what will people be willing to leave their houses for in the future as they've gotten used to this rhythm of being home more? Um, even post pandemic, what will make them feel safe? Um, we all know sort of the reality of what is safe and then what is perceived to be safe can be two separate things. And so as a library, where do we put our energy to really tap into what people will be compelled to come out for and then when we all do emerge from our houses, um, where do we go? Where are people gonna be at that point? So um, next slide, please, Jeff. I'll end by saying what you all already know that uh, libraries are really vital. They always have been, but I think now more than ever and what you do is vital. So I think it's vital that we find a way to do our work even when the tools that we typically use like our buildings are no longer able to be used in the same way. We couldn't plan for this pandemic. I don't know what the future holds. Don mentioned the fires and all the other things that are happening. Um, so I don't know that we can fully plan our way out of whatever's in the future, but I do think we can build libraries that are more flexible. We can create a work culture that embraces change more quickly. Um, and develop work habits that are less tied to history and more better and better able to adapt to the future. So um, that's sort of where my brain is right now. Um, Jeff, I don't know if you wanted, I don't know where we are in time, if you wanted me to touch on some of the things we've tried during the pandemic. Well, um, well, we have completely blown past any sort of time barriers, I think. <laughs> um, but so, so Don, I'll, I'll leave it to you to, uh, um, to determine what well, we, we, we have gone a bit over, but this has just been so great, so full of fascinating, interesting stuff that, you know, we are, and we're still recording. This is, uh, this is all great stuff. Uh, it, it hits me that, uh, you know, the theme through this is the same theme that emerged from, as you were talking about, Jeff, this period of, of focusing on space. And it, the more that libraries started focusing on space for the last, you know, 10, 15 years, more and more functions started coming in, you know, this list of things and this army knife of, of things to do in space. And that led to flexibility, which uh, Barbara and Sarah and Chuck have all made the point about the value of that. And so now, well, you know, flexibility is paying off uh, in, in Barbara's big open spaces. 
uh, that looks like, you know, it, it can be used in the current environment. The thing that occurs to me uh, as, as we try to anticipate, and it's a great point, Sarah, it's really difficult, I know it's coming, but I don't see that we're not gonna be paying a lot of attention to how close we are to other people for a long time. You know, even if there's a vaccine, a lot of people are not gonna take it. Everybody will be potentially a hazard to other people and we'll just be further apart. Maybe not as far apart now, but still there'll be a distance issue. So how do you, without going out into the community where you have the whole community as your, as your library, uh, your extended virtual physical library, uh, how do you plan to accommodate a space demand for the same number of people at a greater distance. Hmm. Uh, it's, you know, this is what's flipped is that the, uh, uh, that, that we need more distance. You know, yeah, people are moving out of the cities. People, you know, everywhere, people are looking for more space around themselves. Uh, and so yeah. how do you see that's gonna affect the, the future of design, both kind of in the near term? And let's imagine this is condition is gonna be years. Uh, yeah, I, John, I, I, I think we're, we're always happy to design bigger and more space, <laughs> um, which would be one level of solution. But what I see libraries doing right now is, is doing two different things or two, two different uh, things that are kind of similar. One is um, limiting attendance, right? So we don't overcrowd buildings and also then limiting the time you can spend um, so that you don't, so everybody gets an opportunity. So I mean, that's, that's just sort of a, a, a band-aid in a way, but until we can feel, get comfortable being, you know, even closer, um, it's probably going to continue. I mean, libraries have been familiar with putting, you know, time limits on, you know, uh, technology access oftentimes, um, uh, but th that, that's what I've seen. Um, so others, what, what, what have you um, seen? I think Don makes a really interesting point of when we get back to full volumes of business, what's happened now is people are self-selecting. Um, there are, you know, so we're not seeing the same numbers we did. And of course that works in tandem because we have um, accordingly reduced, say the number of people that could be in a large conference room. So at this stage, um, we're okay, but when it sh shifts, then it is going to be a challenge. Um, and it's, it's a great question. I mean, off the top of my head, again, kind of what we've done, which is providing options, which are digital, in some cases, the support and programming, and also really exploiting any opportunity for outside the library space. Just, I think we're gonna have to really look at that. What can we do that's different that we didn't take advantage of? Um, you know, I'm picturing one of our libraries and it really does have a lot of outside space it's typically not been used in the same way um it's been more we've been in the building but i think there would be opportunities as things um continue that we might have to think about adding tables outside and really thinking about which of our services could move outside when the weather permits right. I mean, it's kind of basic but it would we help can learn from other industries it. you know like um uh, restaurants you know, accommodating people in the outdoor environment to the extent that you can. I, I, I understand yeah. the, uh, it's very difficult to rent a heat lamp, these, you know, right, uh, right now or require right. one um, because that's, we're, we're transitioning into the colder months and uh, mm -hmm. outdoor environments are still wanting to be used. You know, I think, I think, you answer, up. Hmm? Go ahead, Chuck. I think you asked a really interesting question. I think that's the real mystery in my mind because I think that the libraries have been looked at by local governments and state funding agencies with a certain metric. You know, there's a certain financial metric they apply. I mean, how many volumes are we housing? How many seats are we creating for the, do for the dollar? Uh, I don't, I haven't heard any client yet tell me they've thought through a new uh, calculus on how to make that work. But if we need to build a new library in Enrico County to seat the same number of people with the same technologies in terms of quantity, the building would be twice the size and cost a lot more money. So, you know, I'm going to try to remain eternally optimistic that this is a blip, you know, in our life. 
you know, we're going to learn from this and we're going to take away some things that are going to help libraries be more meaningly, meaningfully connected to the communities in a physical and virtual way. But then we're going to get back to a normal where, you know, human beings need to be with each other. Um, and I said this on, on the call prep, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of germs out there that we need to be exposed to. Was it 99% or more of the bacteria in the world are things we need to be uh, in contact with to stay healthy? They're good. It's good bacteria for us. And, and hyper cleaning libraries and hyper cleaning your home and everything you touch is not helping you be necessarily healthier. Um, so I don't, I don't know where this goes. I'm not a health professional. I do not pretend to be one on TV or otherwise. But I think we've got to ride this out and use the best intelligence we have. We have been on webinar after webinar after webinar for months, and everybody has a different version of how to, how to keep buildings clean, how to keep a uh, fabric clean and hard surfaces clean. And, and I, you know, it, it's, it's really perplexing to me but to see where it'll go. I think everyone's gonna do the best they can for the for, for quite right for talk about about benevolent uh, bacteria that that we don't really appreciate. Uh, and, and I think there's a social corollary to that, that we're missing out on a lot of social interactions that mm -hmm. we really don't know the effect of it. Uh, mm -hmm. It's driving us more to digital, which is already, even before the pandemic, was itself a, an epidemic of uh, influence by uh, online. As, many, as much as we want everybody to have a chance to be connected, I highly recommend the Netflix uh, Social Dilemma. It's just out documentary, you know, uh, get hold of your chair when you watch it. It's, it's, it's alarming to say the least. It's not totally surprising that people are paying attention, but uh, when you think about the ages of children that are being exposed all the time, it's really an issue. And I think this gets back to uh, 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 the, the issue of trust in libraries that are that's so powerful. And as, as is generally being, de as it's declining in society, as we have a loss of trust in our institutions and each other and so on and on, the libraries keep rising up just by doing nothing, just by contrast to everything else is, is kind of falling down around them. And people will continue to turn to libraries and see libraries in new ways as a place for answers, place for information. Uh, that, you know, the, the sources for accurate information, for trusted information uh, are, are declining, just the way it's fragmenting. So the challenges are rising. The library has those challenges. We've talked about a whole bunch of them today, but they also represent an opportunity. And that's going to be the real challenge is to identify and then have the wherewithal to actually step up to those challenges. And uh, so we're really excited about that. We're also, you know, somewhat trepidatious about that because it's, it's fraught, uh, but that's the world we live in. That's the world we've created. And, you know, here we go. Um, we didn't talk, I think enough about the outside in winter because <laughs> I've, we've just talked about this rising demand and, you know, uh, Sarah is out there, uh, and I don't know how you're going to, how to heat these outside spaces. The demand should go up with winter and the supply should go down with winter. This is the winter economics. So, uh, we'll, we'll, let's close with that. Talk about what you see for the winter. Each, uh, go through our speakers and we'll use that as a kind of a wrap up. We've gone a full hour and a half, but I think it's just been great and, and appreciate it. Uh, Jeff, uh, we've had a ton of requests for slides and we had a suggestion about a place to post slides. If you're willing to share those and send it to me, I'll post them up. Would that work for you? Okay. Yeah. So uh, let's, uh, let's go in reverse order and talk about the winter ahead. What do you see for the winter ahead? Uh, 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 Sarah, what, what do you see? How are you going to manage? What do you expect? Well, we're lucky in that um, winters here are pretty mild. Uh, we're lucky if we get one snow. Um, but I think our approach through the pandemic has been to work with partner organizations to get services to people. So we've really beefed up things like deposit collections to daycares, um, to get books in the hands of teachers. 
with our adult day facilities um, and that sort of thing. We've been doing book drops in communities and filling little free libraries with free books just to get materials out into the community. Um, and the same thing we've been doing hotspots and parks to increase some internet connectivity. So those sorts of things don't require our staff to be out in the elements to do them. Um, our buildings are still closed. So uh, we haven't had to wrestle with some of that yet. But I think that's the way going forward is just getting for us is just getting creative about um, tackling real needs and moving materials out into the community through our partner organizations primarily. That's great. Actually, Sarah, you're the first librarian I've heard uh, adopt uh, the little free library as <laughs> as an extension. Uh, I, I agree with you, but you know anything to provide uh, reading and and literature and services for people that that they're looking for. Anyway, uh, so uh, Chuck winterizes. Uh, I'm I live in Central Virginia, not too far from from Sarah, right near Barbara. We have mild winters. Um, we are, you know, I don't know what the, our libraries are going to do here. I haven't talked to all of them. I think there's there's going to be a lot of challenge. Um, I think we're going to see um, people spend a lot of time outside to the extent they can tolerate it. And Jeff's right, there are no heat lamps to be had uh, to buy or to rent um, anywhere around. So it's going to be, I think, a long winter for a lot of folks. Um, I think I think what is concerning me is what I read about the, the concern about you know mental health and, and social isolation for so many people in our community where it's been a little mitigated thus far because of the weather, but now as we get into the darker, colder months, it's going to be even more difficult for those folks. And I hope our libraries can find ways of, of continuing that outreach in a way to support those, those people and give them, give them access to resources to kind of weather the storm. It's going to be a difficult time for us in this country. And uh, I, I see and I'm hopeful that libraries will continue to be that, um, that beacon for so many people if they, if they feel like they can reach out and, and are comfortable doing so. Well said, Chuck. Well said, uh, Barbara. I think you were talking about doing outreach, uh, phoning people. Did you say or um, there what was? I think there. Yeah, we have an outreach division also. Um, though we're right now, I would say what we'll do in the winter is fight the good fight. Um, we are open. We have seven out of our nine libraries open with reduced hours. Um, we operate very methodically and carefully as safely as we can. And so far we've done really well. Um, that being said, we keep open. I think that's so important in all of this. Things can change. That's what we've learned here. Um, they can change very quickly. And so right now, I think our resources will be continuing daily operations, um, adding in some um, extras like we had the dial of story, I think you noticed, which is kind of an old school technology. People love it. You literally call in and hear a story. It's wonderful. Um, so I think we will press on through the winter, um, just working with our county and the, the transition teams that support us, which has been fantastic, um, to get guidance about how we might need to change or not, or how we might, if we're fortunate enough, be able to provide a little more service and expand some of the phases that we haven't um, launched back into operation yet. And if we need to retreat or retract, we can do that the same type of way that we move forward with opening. Um, but what I think is most important is for us to continue however possible safely to support others. And that can be through programming or just having a print book in hand, an ebook, um, a Facebook live story time. We're just gonna fight the good fight as I started to say, um, through the winter. Right. You know, I think Don was referencing the notion that you have been talking about of a outreach mechanism to people who don't have technology. Um, oh, okay, they, yes. In oh, addition to dial a story, the other sort of um, not high tech program that we may be folding in or planning to, in fact, I saw the sample yesterday, is we are adding a traditional books by mail service. It was initially intended um, for a certain population. And now that COVID has struck, it may be used for people who would like to have books mailed to their home um, hmm. if they don't prefer curbside. Again, something that you might not think about, but since we were already bringing it up, we wonder now if 
there might be a different and expanded audience for that service. And our friends of the library are underwriting it, which is wonderful too. So collaboration. Great. Yeah. Jeff, so well, Don, get the last word here. Yeah, well, I'm in Massachusetts and we do get winter here occasionally. Um, sometimes we get it in in October and sometimes we get it in May, um, sometimes even in between. Um, but in Massachusetts in particular, most libraries have reopened in one way or another and the, the, the restrictions are decreasing over time rather than increasing. And then where there's, an, you know, there was some, there's a flare up then additional restrictions are, are being put in place. But so what, what I see coming for the winter probably is increasingly relaxed restrictions. And so more people actually being able to get into buildings. And what that will mean is probably much more uh, um, energy expenditures in terms of, you know, uh, heating and cooling costs because we're opening the buildings to, you know, 100% outdoor airflow as opposed to some smaller percentage, which means all of that needs to be conditioned and then it's just dumped outside, you know, for a lot of buildings, those sophisticated systems are not recovering heat as it exhausts. So the, I, I think in order to keep people safe, we're going to have to invest, uh, you know, in, in extra heat oil, essentially this winter, uh, thinking about the way New England is and, and what the primary energy sources are. So, you know, that, that's kind of how I see it going in the short term, Don. Okay, okay. Uh, I think Chuck touched on uh, HVAC and, and air circulation is, is a critical factor in indoor environments going forward. Uh, okay, well, I think this is gonna be a wrap here. Uh, hopefully uh, next spring, um, uh, Sarah, you made me think of uh, maybe you can get your your truck running, and uh, you could you could merge it with a ice cream truck. So you could you know have a bell coming on, and you know the ice cream and the books are coming around. So maybe that's an idea for the spring. But let's get through the winter. Uh, thank you all for coming. It's been fantastic. We'll have the recording up by Monday, and I will get these slides up somewhere and send out a. Uh, a notice uh, on how to get them. Uh, thank you all, Jeff, Barbara, Chuck, Sarah, wonderful, wonderful people doing great work. Keep it up and come back sometime. Will do. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.